on Friday evening at approximately 7.30 p.m., I visited Toby's Bar and Grill. Exhausted from dedicating the preceding two days to negotiations with a prominent international bank in the hustle and bustle of the Big Apple, I arrived feeling completely drained. At the start of the day, my outlook was pessimistic, questioning the likelihood of reaching any agreement. However, as our Friday meeting unfolded, unresolved challenges began to resolve themselves, one after another, resembling a cascade of falling dominoes. By noon, only two significant hurdles remained. Opting for a break and some nourishment, we decided to venture out for lunch. I located the nearest Jewish deli and indulged in a decadently large pastry meat and Swiss cheese sandwich on rye bread, savoring every mouthful. When we reconvened at 1.30, George Willis, the bank's lead negotiator, said, We have made enormous progress. I suggest splitting the difference on the last two points. George passed the paper across the conference table, and I read what he was proposing. It definitely didn't split the difference equally, but it was easily within the bounds of what my partners and I could accept to win this big contract. I scribbled my initials on the page, and George said he would email me the official contract on Monday. After shaking hands, we went in different directions. I returned to my hotel, packed my things, and checked out. I was thinking about staying in town for the night because my fiancé Trish was away for the weekend with her two older sisters. They stopped at one of Connecticut's giant Indian casinos. They planned to spend their days at the pool and spa and their evenings at the best bars and restaurants. Instead of spending another night away from home, I headed to Grand Central Station and took the Metro North train to New Haven. By 7.30, I was on I-91 toward Hartford and off the highway. I was heading through the always popular downtown West Hartford, where I decided to stop for dinner. I was sitting at Toby's bar when I noticed my two future daughters-in-law through the bar mirror sliding into a horseshoe-shaped table. Their husband settled down next to them. The immediate knot in my stomach and the pain that seemed to spread through every inch of my body told me that my wedding plans, which were exactly eight weeks away, were in trouble. My sister's in-law were supposed to be at the casino with Trish. I left the bar, called Trish, and she answered, Hello, my love. How's the big city? Everything is the same as always. We have completed successful negotiations, and I am heading to dinner. How I wish you were with me. You're so cute, Chris. I miss you too. We had a ball all day. We lounged by the pool and sipped drinks. I get a pretty good pre-wedding taunt. I'd meeting my sisters for dinner in a few minutes. Trish and I talked a little more before exchanging. I love yous and ending the call. I checked the Find My Phone app and entered Trish's information. I'm not sure where Trish was, but her phone number was in Falmouth, Massachusetts, on the western tip of Cape Cod. Damn, I thought. Trish's longtime neighbor and friend, Nick Flaherty, had a family home in Falmouth. We were invited there several times. Looking through my contact information, I found Sue Flaherty's phone number and called. Sue answered. I said, hello, Sue. This is Chris Harrington. Chris, Chris Harrington. What a pleasant surprise. How are the wedding plans going? Nick, and I can't wait for the festivities. To be honest, I'm not sure how the plans are going. Sue laughed. This is a typical male reaction. Tell Sue, did Nick go on a trip this weekend? What a strange question. Nick almost never has to travel on the weekends, but this weekend he's away. What's the matter? Sue asked with slight concern in her voice. Do you have a Find My Phone application on your phone? Sue involuntarily sobbed and said almost in a whisper, not again. A minute later she continued, he should be in Philadelphia, but the beacon shows that he is in his family's cottage. With a sad sigh, I said, sorry Sue, Nick and Trish are there together. Sue cried quietly for several minutes. This is not the first time, she admitted. I'm going to call that son of a bitch and tell him not to come home. Can I ask you a favor, Sue? Trish isn't due home until Sunday afternoon. Same thing with Nick. Let's postpone our confrontation until tomorrow evening. In the meantime, I'm going to change the locks on my condominium doors and withdraw half of the wedding money from our joint account. I will pack all her clothes and other personal items and leave the bags in the driveway. You're right, Chris. I'll do the same. Please write or call if you need to talk to someone.
I'm sorry I had to tell you. Sue started crying again, and between sobs she said, It's not your fault, Chris. My last call was to Billy Jones, a friend and neighbor. I need help, Billy. Will you be home tomorrow morning? My only plans are to sleep until noon, but Sally will wake me up at 7 dasa. What can I do for you? Can you change the locks on my front door and the door leading out of the garage and change the code on your garage door opener? I will be very grateful. There was a moment of silence before Billy said, Crap, is the wedding canceled? Unless I'm missing something important, Trish and I are dead and buried. I understand. I'll do this first thing in the morning and change everything. Fitz, yes, Billy, thank you. Feeling 20 years older, I trudged back to Topi's and headed towards the bar. I looked in the mirror at the reflection of my daughters-in-law and their husbands as the waiter cleared away their appetizers. I grabbed a bar stool and made my way to my former future family's table with my drink. As I plopped down on the stool at the end of the table, climbed into the seat, and glared between Julie and Karen, the atmosphere quickly became chilly. Chris, buddy, come here, look at the menu, said Steve, Karen's husband. Without taking my eyes off the women, I answered, no thanks, Steve, I won't stay long. I continued to look at Julie and Karen in silence until Roy, Julie's husband, asked, what's going on, Chris? Ask your wife, Roy. Roy and Steve turned to their wives. It was easy to see that both women were scared to death. What's happening? Steve asked the sisters. Karen spoke first. It's not what you think, Chris. I guess that's exactly what I think. Steve and Roy looked from their wives to me. As tears streamed down Karen's face, Steve asked again, What's going on, Chris? Your wives are covering for Trish. They were all together in my kitchen last Tuesday. Since I was going to be out of town until Sunday, they were going to Foxwoods Casino for the weekend. Where is Trish? Roy asked the sisters. When they were silent, he turned and looked at me. She's at Nick's house on Cape Cod. This is true, Steve hissed. At this moment, both women were crying. Karen nodded in agreement. Julie sobbed. Trish loves you, Chris. She really loves it. Steve rolled his eyes and Roy stared at the tabletop. She has a great way of showing her love. She and her sisters are lying to me. And she's going away with the old neighbor guy for a weekend of sex fest just eight weeks before she marries me. Your sister is a piece of shit. Do not dare. Roy interrupted his wife. Shut the fuck up, Julie. Turning to me, he asked, What are you going to do? Of course, I'm going to cancel the wedding. Both friends leaned back in their chairs. Their wives cried even more. Daddy spent so much money on the wedding and reception, Karen sobbed. I don't care, I'm not gonna marry a lying, cheating slut like Trish. I waited a few moments. We talked to Sue Flaherty about Nick cheating with Trish. We both like 24 hours before we crush them. Nick cheating with Trish. We both like 24 hours before we crush them. Four pairs of eyes were looking at me as I asked Roy and Steve, I need your help. Can you make sure my head jerked towards their wives? Can you make sure that they don't contact Trish before 6.15 tomorrow night? Both women began to protest before Steve said, Of course we can, mate. And then, turning to his wife, he said, You disgust me. I have to wonder if your sisters ever had your back while you cheated on me. Karen was stunned, and Steve continued, If you or Julie get involved with Trish in any way, I will consider filing for divorce. Roy's face was bright red with anger. His words caused Julie to groan sadly as he said, After the problems we had at the beginning of our third year of marriage, I could have filed for divorce anyway, but rest assured, I will definitely apply if you contact Trish. I shook hands with both men and left the restaurant. Saturday was busy. It took me several hours to remove the last traces of Trish from our house. Instead of piling filled garbage bags in the driveway, I rented a small storage unit and my neighbor Billy lent me his pickup truck. It only took three trips to get all the bags to the warehouse. The hardest part was writing the letter to our wedding guests. I worked on email in chunks throughout the warehouse. The hardest part was writing the letter to our wedding guests. I worked on email in chunks throughout the day. It said topic, Harrington and Clark wedding news. Dear friends, I'm currently halfway through my wedding. 
just eight short weeks before my wedding day, to Trish Clark. The weekend was spectacular because I discovered that Trish spent her weekend in another man's bed. Trish and her longtime neighbor, Nick Flaherty, cheated on me and Nick's wife, Sue. With the help of sisters Trish, Karen, and Julie and their lies, the couple spends the weekend together on Cape Cod. You may wonder why I find this terrible behavior impressive. The reason is simple. I'm not married to Trish. It's much easier to call off a wedding than to go through the pain of divorce. This letter is my official notice that I am canceling my wedding to Trish Clark. Sincerely, Christopher Harrington. I called Sue Flaherty at 5.30 on a Saturday afternoon. Together, we told each other about the tasks we were able to complete. Because Sue was married, it was much more difficult for her to break up with Nick. She was able to speak with a lawyer and had an appointment scheduled for Monday morning. The lawyer recommended canceling joint credit cards and separating family finances as much as possible. This was typical legal advice in case of divorce. We ended our call a few minutes before 6 p.m. and agreed to send our couples a message at 6 and sharp. My message simply said, I hope you enjoy your weekend with Nick. Thank you for showing me in the world that you are a liar and a cheat. Our wedding is canceled. I sent the message at exactly 6 p.m. And immediately I sent an email to our family and guests. 16 months later, I stood on the edge of the altar. My best man and groomsmen flanked me. The bridesmaids looked stunning as they walked down the center aisle of the church. Tears welled up in my eyes as I looked towards the back of the church. Trisha's father stood proudly, dressed in his black tuxedo. His eyes, like mine and those of the rest of our guests, were focused on the most beautiful bride in the world. Her blonde hair was styled and looked beautiful under the small white veil. Blue eyes sparkled and were full of love, and dark red lips suggested wicked thoughts about our upcoming wedding night. The tight white wedding dress emphasized her heavenly figure without making her look slutty. It was wonderful. As Mr. Clark and my fiance walked down the aisle towards me, I felt a pair of eyes boring a hole into me. I looked around at the guests on my side of the church before looking at the bride's side. That's when I saw Trish. Tears rolled down her cheeks. I saw her say quietly, I'm sorry, before she turned to her father and little sister walking toward me. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.